centuries of hatred between Catholics and Protestants are relived every week by fans of Glasgow's two famous football clubs, Celtic and Rangers. The bigotry and the animosity stems from way, way back hundreds of years, but it's as a very real contemporary threat and, and rightly is known as Scotland's shame. Parcel bombs were sent to the manager of Celtic and other high-profile supporters. These are what the police call viable devices, which means that uh, potentially they could maim or, or even kill. A battle over national identity is being fought on the streets of a British city. They do not like Britain, and they see themselves as having a hatred of Britain. The ancient um, and bitter sectarian tensions of the north of Ireland were simply decanted into West Central Scotland. The Scottish Government has introduced a new law to arrest those who incite sectarian violence, including fans who chant songs that go their rivals. We've been singing songs about the IRA for years. It's never gonna, it's never gonna stop. Celtic Rangers will always, always be sectarian. In April 2011, two football fans from the west of Scotland made parcel bombs and posted them to the manager of a rival team. Neil Lennon has been living this nightmare for some time. While none exploded, it brought global attention to a menacing social division based on religion that remains festering in Scotland today. This is just not going to be tolerated anymore. Any sectarian displays or unacceptable conduct will be eradicated from, uh, from our football grounds. In Scotland's Parliament, the parcel bombs exposed unsettling questions about national identity and religious prejudice. As well as Neil Lennon, bombs were sent to two prominent Celtic supporters, Lennon's lawyer and a member of the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government was in shock. It convened a cabinet meeting that Friday and promised tough action to eradicate sectarian violence and bigotry from football. But not everyone was surprised it had happened. Everyone who lives in the west of Scotland knows how deep-seated and entrenched the bigotry and sectarianism can be. So while it was shocking to discover that local people had that much hatred in them and extremism in them, there was no surprise really that it did come from this part of the country. Campbell Martin is a journalist from the west coast of Scotland. His patch covers the towns where the two bombers lived. One of them is from Salkoats, both from North Ayrshire, one's from Salkoats, one's from Kawinning, which is five miles down the road. Uh, they appear to have known each other through their mutual uh, support of Glasgow Rangers Football Club and possibly other shared interests associated with that, um, likes of politics, religion and uh, fans' forums on the internet. Saltcoats is typical of the small communities that lie along the Ayrshire coast, about a half hour's drive from Glasgow. Campbell Martin is from the nearby town of Androssen. In towns like Androssen, Salkoaks and across the whole of the west of Scotland, there is a, a real divide between Protestants and Catholics. The, in general terms, people get on with their neighbours, they get on with their friends, they have friends of, of different religions, they go for drinks with their friends and they get on. But there is, and deep in the psyche in the west of Scotland, there is still a religious divide between Protestants and Catholics, and that manifests itself most significantly at, at football matches, at old firm matches. If you go to a Rangers Celtic game, it's palpable. You can feel the hatred from either side of the ground, and yet this is people who live in the same communities and who get on with each other in general terms. And here, we're just turning into a street where one of the bombers lived. This, this is the the home street of a man who was so caught up in the religious bigotry that he took upon himself to send a bomb to someone. It's madness. The Celtic manager, Neil Lennon, has already been assaulted more than once by Rangers fans who accuse him of mixing football with politics. He's a Northern Irish person. He's, he's on record as being in support of a United Ireland. He's a Roman Catholic 
and he also can be perceived as quite an abrasive personality. He's um, maybe stoked to flames of hatred with some of his actions and some of his carry-ons. He's been caught on camera calling Rangers fans orange bees. Obviously, I don't want to use the, the word. He's uh, spat on a Rangers scarf when it was lying on the ground at Ibrox during the match. <laughs> The feud between Celtic and Rangers is played out at least four times a year at what are called Old Firm Games. This match was at Ibrox, the home of Rangers. Each side celebrates a separate national identity. Rangers have always been the club of the, the, the British establishment, the royal family. We love our heritage, we love our background, uh, we love our Britishness. We are the quintessential British football team. They're loyal, they're still loyal to the Crown, whereas Celtic are more Republican, they're no loyal to the Crown, they don't fancy the Crown. We seem to have an awful lot of people who are born in Glasgow who want to pretend they're Irish. Many Celtic fans celebrate the fact that the club rejects the British establishment. A lot of people don't like getting classed as British because of some of the things that Britain have done. They're, they're entering illegal wars and... Uh, a lot of people don't like being called British. I'm Scottish, Scotch Irish, I would class myself as. The roots of today's confrontation lie in a battle over 300 years ago in Ireland. A Protestant, King William of Orange, defeated a Catholic army under James II at the Battle of the Boyne. James was the last Catholic monarch to rule over England and had tried to regain his throne. The Battle of the Boyne secured British rule over Ireland and a Protestant royal succession in London. The bigotry that's associated with Rangers and Celtic stems from English imperialism, the, the fact that England dominated its two smaller neighbours, Ireland and Scotland. And the Scots get involved because Protestant Scots were sent to Ireland to settle the land on behalf of the English aristocracy. Thousands of Scots owned plantations in Ireland on land confiscated by the English crown. For over three centuries, their rallying cry has been no surrender to the Catholic majority in Ireland. The hatreds bred on Irish soil were soon transported as a byproduct of tragedy to the west coast of Scotland. In the 1840s and 1850s, there was Europe's greatest human catastrophe, the Great Irish Famine, with um, probably slightly over a million people dying from famine-related diseases and 1.2 million emigrating. So at that period, they were almost searching for survival. I mean, to put it absolutely bluntly, growing up in Ireland meant preparing to leave Ireland. At that time, Scotland was the second most prosperous nation in the world. Industries in the Glasgow area needed workers, and the Irish were a source of cheap labour. One of the things, especially in the 19th century, that Scottish entrepreneurs did, by recruiting Irish workers for the mills, for the ironworks, and for the coal mines, they often settled them in separate villages. And to this day, in parts of West Central Scotland, you can actually point to in small villages, most of them now de-industrialised, which are overwhelmingly Protestant or overwhelmingly Catholic. Huge communities of Irish established themselves in the west of Scotland. One set of, of immigrants, the Catholics, formed a football club called Glasgow Celtic. The other formed Glasgow Rangers. Rangers was established in 1872 with links to the Protestant Church of Scotland. By the early 20th century, Catholic players were asked to leave the club. Loudon's Bar in the Govan district of Glasgow is a gathering place for fans before a match. Rangers' identity as a Protestant club, loyal to the British crown, was sealed when another group of Irish immigrants came to Scotland. Rangers became the predominantly Protestant club, if you like, when Northern Ireland ship builders came over in 1923 to work in Govan. They couldn't support, obviously, the Catholic 
club, it was Celtic, so they supported the nearest club, which was Rangers. Um, now, we were Church of Scotland formed anyway, so the two of them married together. On the other side of Glasgow, Baird's Bar is a favourite haunt for Celtic fans. The club won Europe's most prestigious trophy in 1967. The bar is a memorial to the club's footballing history as well as its Irish heritage. Celtic was founded in 1888 at a local Catholic church. Celtic was uh, founded for St Mary's just along the road there and it was to feed the poor. They were founded as a charity. Most of the poor at that time were, were Irish, Irish immigrants that had come over during the famine. In the 19th century, the Protestant faith was considered a central component of Scottish identity, especially after the act of union with England and Scotland's prominent role in promoting British imperialism. Protestantism, which of course was the official religion of the British Empire, was especially powerful in Scotland because of the fact that after 1707 Scotland was a stateless nation and it drew powerfully its identity from the, the Protestant tradition. The Irish Catholics who came to Scotland were presented with a Scottish identity which emphasised Protestantism and empire. They couldn't relate to that. The Church of Scotland insisted that those who rejected the Protestant faith were unwelcome. The Church of Scotland actually ran a campaign to send them back to Ireland. The Church of Scotland wanted no Irish Catholics in Scotland. The classic text was published in 1923, The Menace of the Irish Race to Our Scottish Civilization, uh, and then reprinted a few months later as The Menace of the Irish Race to Our Scottish Nationality. And very interestingly in that text, that pamphlet, which became a bestseller, it exempted the Orange Irish, that is the Protestant Irish. Unable to halt the flow of immigrants, Scotland's governing class instead began favouring Protestant workers. From the 1930s onwards, you start getting evidence of people from a Catholic background being asked when they go for a job, what school were you at? And if he answered by saying St Andrews, St Matthews, that's a giveaway, you're a Catholic, so you didn't get the job. Discrimination against the Catholic Irish for both economic reasons and ideological or religious reasons was rife. But the evidence seems to suggest that it lasted longer in Scotland. Irish Catholic people, the second generation in particular, in the USA it reached occupational parity. That means they were part of the norm in terms of uh, jobs, etc., with the indigenous population as early as 1901. Same thing in Canada. In, in Australia and New Zealand it was the 1920s. In Scotland it was 2001. Although things have improved massively, the residue of disadvantage is still there. Today, the education system remains divided by religion. Protestants argue that separate Catholic schools are responsible for sustaining sectarianism. But according to Campbell Martin, state schools are Protestant in all but name. We're just about to approach a school. This is a Rosson Academy. This is a school I attended when I was younger. This is uh, officially a non-denominational school for 12 to 16 year olds, but ask anyone locally and they'll tell you it's a Protestant school. What we have here is, is a, a metaphor for the, the separate development of education in Scotland because we've got playing fields here and we're just coming up to another secondary school for 12 to 16 year olds, but this one is for Catholics. The playgrounds of these schools are breeding grounds for the sectarianism and bigotry that manifests itself elsewhere in society at football matches and, and elsewhere. Sectarianism is um, it's a thing of the past. Unless, of course, you count separate schooling. If you can tell me a reason for having separate education, I would be delighted to hear it. But are the state schools Protestant schools? No, they're public schools. We don't have Protestant schools. We're not bigots. At football grounds, sectarianism takes shape in song. After the parcel bombs were sent to the Celtic manager and prominent supporters, the Scottish government introduced a law 
that aim to outlaw aggressive chanting. The bill makes it a crime to stir up hatred against a group of persons based on their religion or culture. Sometimes it means the police have to determine a person's intent. They're telling you you can get the jail if you sing God Save the Queen aggressively or bless yourself aggressively. Now, I, I, I don't know what God Save the Queen aggressively means. I only know the one tune to it. Songs like No Surrender have tried to ban, but they can't ban No Surrender for the simple reason being it's a song about, again, triumphalism. You get people people saying that songs are offensive, the, the Irish national anthem, a soldier's song, is offensive. That's not offensive to me, you know, it's a national anthem of a country, it's not offensive. Celtic come to Ibrox and you, you hear it all the time, it's like they sing the Irish national anthem and they boo the, the British national anthem, so it's messed up, it's strange, it's strange, it's a strange mentality. One chant that has been targeted by the police is a Rangers anthem called the Billy Boys. Now the Billy Boys is not called, as you might expect, after one of their great heroes, William of Orange. It is actually named after one William Fullerton, who was a Glasgow gang leader of the early 1930s, and his gang were called the Billy Boys. It was a razor gang, and they just called themselves the Billy Boys. Open razors, that was the, that was the weapon of choice in the day, before the, the guns and things in there. And they, they were a staunch Protestant gang at the time. He was certainly of fascist tendency. His gangs were used to break up strikes in the 1926, the great general strike of 1926. And he was also authorised by the American Ku Klux Klan uh, to set up a branch in Glasgow, not devoted to anti-black behaviour, but to anti-Catholic behaviour. There's the infamous line in it, which runs, we're up to our knees in Fenian blood. The song refers to Irish Catholics by the derogatory term Fenian. It was basically it was a gang song in the day, and it was just took over the Ibrox as a, a song for the Rangers fans. Why would you want anybody to sing up to your knees in Fenian blood? I think that they really need to sort themselves out. It's quite difficult for the police and stewards to police that. The fans should police it. Rangers have sang songs like the Billy Boys for, for a number of years and they say that this is offensive. The Billy Boys in my book is, is not entirely an offensive song because it, it's tribalism. That's all they sing. All they sing. Everything they sing is offensive. We've just got to take it. That's one of the songs that come under the banning order the, the, because of the Fenian reference in it. Most people, and most normal people, think this has been a total overreaction by the government. It seems that they've took a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Some Rangers fans say they no longer chant the most offensive slogans, including an expletive directed at the Pope, referred to by the acronym FTP. The Rangers fans, to be fair to them, have, have stopped singing it. We have been asked to stop singing up to an ease in Fenian blood. We've asked to be stopped singing Add non the Pope at the end. Um, we, we stopped it. FTP, you seen that FTP everywhere. That's you seen that everywhere. That was that was a, the, the most common graffiti in the city of Glasgow was FTP, and that was just the directed at the Pope. All of a sudden, everybody's anti-Catholic, everybody's anti-Celtic, everybody's anti-Irish. You could not make this up. If you grow up in the west of Scotland, um, if you're born a Protestant and raised a Protestant. You, you will grow up and you will know the songs. I mean, it's inevitable. You, you know them. I know them. It's the same on the Catholic side. It's, it's indoctrinated. You learn it at the knee, as it were. Another song banned under the recent legislation is known as the famine song. The words of the famine song is, why don't you go home? Why don't you go home? The famine is over. Why don't you go home? We fed them the They're saying that we come over here because of the famine. Now the famine's over, why don't you go home? You've got your potatoes back, why don't you go back to Ireland? 
the reason why Rangers fans sang, why don't you go home, why don't you go home, it was humour. The so-called famine song was not an attack on Irish people. It was not an attack on Catholics, it was not an attack on people that starved to death. The famine song was a sator satorical attack on the so-called Glaswegians who believe they are Irish. It's a racist song. It's not a funny subject. Like, millions of people died through the famine. Celtic fans come into Glasgow, they have Ireland flags, and they think Glasgow is part of Ireland. So we sing, if you've come here, why don't you go home? It's not, it's not offensive, it's funny. The famine was not a joke to people that lived through it. It was a terrible thing. It's part of football banter. I am not saying it is nice. I am not saying there's any excuse for it, but what I am saying, it's not going to cause anybody to cry in their bed at night. The songbook of the Celtic fans often highlights rebellion against colonial rule, especially in Ireland. There's clear evidence of Celtic supporters chanting things like up the Ra, that is the provisional IRA. Now their argument is these are purely political statements and they are unambiguously non-sectarian. We've been singing songs about the IRA for years. It's never gonna it's never gonna stop. They said they were gonna arrest people singing songs about the IRA. It didn't stop anybody, you know, not at all. They sing songs about Irish prisoners of war. They sing very, very offensive songs to normal, you know, common sense, common minded people. The old IRA as they call them absolutely murdered and slaughtered Protestants for being Protestants in Ireland. They basically done an ethnic cleansing in Ireland that all the people up here seem to think, oh no, that's okay, it's just, just about a crack. Celtic fans are basically singing about a history where they were attacked, the Irish were attacked, where they fought back, where they tried to free their country. The Rangers fans and the Protestant and British uh, side of it is basically glorying in, in the fact that they did occupy a country and take over a country. The rivalry between the two clubs extends beyond the battlegrounds of Ireland to a broader world view. The Protestant side is more about imperialism. They'll support Israel because it seemed to be part of the, the sort of the Western hegemony in, in the Middle East. Um, whereas the Celtic supporters who are coming from a perspective of the Irish being oppressed and having to fight for their freedom naturally would side with the Palestinians who are oppressed and occupied as Ireland was. Celtic fans see themselves as some sort of freedom fighters of the oppressed all over the world. I mean, they go about with t-shirts with Che Guevara on them. Um, they support the Basque region. Um, they fly Palestinian flags. I just don't understand their politics. In 2012, mismanagement forced Rangers Football Club into administration. With debts of more than £120 million, the future of the club looked insecure. The Rangers fans who sent the parcel bombs were jailed. While the identities of both football clubs remain trapped in age-old battles and prejudices, the crisis at Rangers is about more than just money. Its supporters are fiercely opposed to the Scottish government's attempt to gain independence from the United Kingdom. Two pound a flag, everybody! Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sir. Their loyalty may soon be to a country of which they are no longer a part. Let's have the Rangers fans fighting for him. In the history of Glasgow Rangers Football Club, 2012 will be considered a year of humiliation and disgrace. As Scotland is becoming increasingly independent, the question is whether Rangers will be able to find an identity which is not rooted in the English establishment, the royalty, and victory over Catholics in a battle 300 years ago. They don't particularly like Scotland. They certainly wouldn't vote for an independent Scotland. They want to be English. They actually um, denigrate as well the Tartan army, the, the Scotland supporters. They, 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 they consider themselves to be British, not Scottish. They're in a minority in Scotland now. But, you know, it's a ridiculous situation in 21st century Scotland that we have people who can't be happy and content 
with the fact that we're born in Scotland and they're Scottish. You're born a Rangers fan. You're born a Rangers fan. You don't choose to be a Rangers fan. You're born a Rangers fan. And you die a Rangers fan. You will die a Rangers fan. And you'll only go to heaven if you're a Rangers fan. <laughs> Um, likes of politics, religion, and uh, fans forums on the internet. Saltcoats is typical of the small communities that lie along the Ayrshire coast, about a half hour's drive from Glasgow. Campbell Martin is from the nearby town of Androssen. In towns like Androssen, Saltcoats, and across the whole of the west of Scotland, there is a, a real divide between Protestants and Catholics. The, in general terms, people get on with their neighbours, they get on with their friends, they have friends of, of different religions, they go for drinks with their friends, and they get on. But there is, and deep in the psyche in the west of Scotland, there is still a religious divide between Protestants and Catholics, and that manifests itself most significantly at, at football matches, at old firm matches. If you go to a Rangers Celtic game... Not everyone was surprised it had happened. Everyone who lives in the west of Scotland knows how deep-seated and entrenched the bigotry and sectarianism can be. So while it was shocking to discover that local people had that much hatred in them and extremism in them, there was no surprise really that it did come from this part of the country. Campbell Martin is a journalist from the west coast of Scotland. His patch covers the towns where the two bombers lived. One of them is from Salkoats, both from North Ayrshire, one's from Salkoats, one's from Kowinning, which is five miles down the road. Uh, they appear to have known each other through their mutual uh, support of Glasgow Rangers Football Club and possibly other shared interests associated. Centuries of hatreds between Catholics and Protestants are relived every week by fans of Glasgow's two famous football clubs, Celtic and Rangers. The bigotry and the animosity stems from way, way back hundreds of years, but it's just a very real contemporary threat, and, and rightly is known as Scotland's shame. Parcel bombs were sent to the manager of Celtic and other high-profile supporters. These are what the police call viable devices, which means that uh, potentially they could maim or, or even kill. A battle over national identity is being fought on the streets of a British city. They do not like Britain, and they see themselves as having a hatred of Britain. The ancient um, and bitter sectarian tensions of the north of Ireland were simply decanted into West Central Scotland. The Scottish Government has introduced a new law to arrest those who incite sectarian violence, including fans who chant songs that go their rivals. We've been singing songs about the IRA for years. It's never gonna, it's never gonna stop. Celtic Rangers will always, always be sectarian. In April 2011, two football fans from the west of Scotland made parcel bombs and posted them to the manager of a rival team. Neil Lennon has been living this nightmare for some time. While none exploded, it brought global attention to a menacing social division based on religion that remains festering in Scotland today. This is just not going to be tolerated anymore. Any sectarian displays or unacceptable conduct will be eradicated from, uh, from our football grounds. In Scotland's Parliament, the parcel bombs exposed unsettling questions about national identity and religious prejudice. As well as Neil Lennon, bombs were sent to two prominent Celtic supporters, Lennon's lawyer and a member of the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government was in shock. It convened a cabinet meeting that Friday and promised tough action to eradicate sectarian violence and bigotry from football. But 